Okay. Grab that cup of coffee and donuts. We're about to get started. Welcome again to the team. Uh, Pastor Brian is traveling again this week. He's looking forward to be with you next Friday. Uh, if you're first time here, glad to have you. If you've uh, been here since the beginning, also glad to have you. A um, couple things, uh, I think, I don't think we have any major announcements. We do have the prayer cards back. Those were missing last week, and so um, you can use the prayer cards if you're new to this. Uh, when we break for discussion, you have a prayer request, just fill those out, set them here, and we'll... I'll let them know about them. You can pray for them around your tables, and I'll wrap us up in prayer at the end. Um, some of you uh, were not fans of the puns last week, but one or two of you were, so backed by less than popular demand. <laughs> it, you know, it is hard to explain puns to kleptomaniacs because they keep taking everything, literally. <laughs> you have to think now. It's early. Well, <laughs> this is high humor, guys. This is not the low-brow stuff of Pastor Brian. What's the difference between a hippo and a zippo? One's really heavy and the other is a little lighter. <laughs> Highlight, that's good. Come on, yes. <laughs> Last night I dreamed I was swimming in an ocean of orange soda, but it was just a fantasy. <laughs> that, that, that's a good one. All right. I lost my job at the bank on my very first day and a woman asked me to check her balance and I pushed her over. <laughs> okay. That, all right, last, last one. Yeah. <laughs> the man who survived pepper spray and mustard gas is now a seasoned veteran. <laughs> that is fantastic. All right. What could be better? Yes, the groans and the one guy applauding. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, this morning, you know, keep with our theme. Uh, we're looking at um, genuine generosity and really the power, the influence of mercy through generosity. And this clip uh, that we're going to show you, I know you're going to watch it and recognize the movie, and you're going to wonder what in the world does this have to do with uh, the theme. But it's just kind of the, what happens every morning, isn't it? So that's the challenge, actually, of Pastor Brian and of me, is to make some connection between guy movie clips and what the Bible has to say about mercy yeah. and generosity. Let's watch this famous clip. We are about to die. Salute you. Ah! 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 Ah!
More, more. How, how, uh, how, how, how tough is Maximus? He has to kill two tigers and the undefeated champion of all time. But he doesn't do it. Uh, that little line there at the end, hopefully you heard it. The guy, when the crowd yells out, Maximus, Maximus the Merciful. If you don't know the story, Maximus is the, is the Roman general that led the legions. And when Marcus Aurelius died, the, his son, the corrupt emperor, wants to kill him. And it's kind of this whole drama loosely based on a couple of people that actually existed. At any rate, the, uh, he's trying to put him to death, have him killed in the arena, and it doesn't work out. In fact, there's at one point when, when Commodus, the emperor, says, he simply won't die. This vexes me. <laughs> but it, his mercy, you know, where the emperor puts the thumb down, which actually I read that thumb up, the actual, the, um, the actual way the emperor would do that was put his thumb up, meaning go ahead with it versus let him live. But anyway, we, this looks better put him to death, and he refuses to do it. So his, his act of mercy is actually an act of defiance in the movie. And there's a sense in which the, God's call on our lives to be merciful and generous is an act of defiance to a culture that operates by different principles. It looks different. It, it cuts against the grain of the current of the culture. If you've got your Bible open to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to look at uh, this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. We looked at the portion last week as well from the same section, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We call that the Sermon on the Mount. And in this section, Jesus is going through a number of, of uh, instructions about what it means to be religious, or what it doesn't mean, I should say. In Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This is a fascinating little passage here. We're going to have to do a little bit of a background, some word work, and some theology here this morning. I know it's early for all that sort of thing. But first, Jesus begins this little section, and he's, what he's doing here is he's giving us warnings about three areas of religious activity in his culture. And you could substitute acti religious activities in our culture of different kinds. Uh, we're only going to look at one, but, but in, the, in the verses that follow, he looks at giving, praying, and fasting. And he talks about the right motivation, the wrong motivation for those three things. And you could substitute any kind of religious activity today. We're just going to look at the giving part, giving to the needy. Notice he says, be careful. This is the key. Be careful. Literally, it means take care or watch out. It's a warning. He's warning us. He's saying, be on your guard, watch out, take care that you don't do something. What's the something he doesn't want you to do? Not to practice your righteousness. That's an interesting phrase. How do you practice your righteousness? The word righteousness is a Greek word that literally meant like your, your, uh, your the word righteousness in, in Greek and in Hebrew has to do with right relationship or right living. 
So if, if I offend Steve uh, Jeffrey here and we have an issue and he comes to me and points it out and I confess it, repent of it, and then say, I'm so sorry, and we get straight, and I say, are we good? And Steve says, we're good. That's like a, a, a human way of thinking about righteousness. We are now right with each other when before we weren't right. So when you think about the word righteousness as it applies to God, how does a man become right with God? Because the Bible says you're not right with him. You've got a thing called sin in your life. How do you get right with him? And the t- typical way of thinking about that is religious activities. Pray enough, give enough, do enough, serve enough, do the stuff so that you get right. Balance the scales. You know, God's got a cosmic sort of grading on a curve going on up there, and you've got to run on the treadmill of religion and do the thing so that he is, you can be right with him. The gospel is different than that. So Jesus is pointing that out, saying, how, when you practice your religious duties, don't do it in a certain way. What's the way not to do it? Be careful not to practice your righteousness, the stuff you do to get right with God, or you think you, that's going to get you right with God, to be seen by others. Did you catch that? If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then he says, so when you give to the needy, he just said, practice your righteousness, and here he says, give to the needy. He's pointing out that's one of the ways you practice your righteousness, giving to the needy. It's, uh, the Greek word is eleosume, and it comes from the, he, the root word ele, which L-E-E-E with a little accent over the E. It literally is the same root word for mercy. See, Jesus connecting, and so did the Jews of his day, and the Bible does, giving to the poor with acts of mercy. Maybe that's the loose connection to Gladiator, Maximus the Merciful. Let's just be clear here when he talks about giving. And I, I, know, I know some people when you know, like I've, I've, had, I've had men tell me when they know it's a, a sermon on money, they, they, they stay home. Uh, they find other things to do on that Sunday morning. And you didn't know maybe that this is Friday morning we're talking about giving and money. Let's be clear. There's no offering being taken here at the end of this, guys. And God doesn't need your money. He's fine without your money. He created all that exists in the universe and ran it before you ever existed with your money. And he did it without spending a penny. He doesn't need your money. But you need to give it. You need to give it, the Bible says. Don't think you're doing God some big favor with your giving, you know. That's not the point. His resources are not limited by our level of generosity in any way. But we need to give. And the reason why is not because God needs it or because the pastor said so or out of guilt. It's because when we do so, it frees us. It does two things. It liberates us and it puts us in the right stream, if you will, or partners us in the right, with the right person. It liberates us from the tyranny and the, and the hold our, our things have on us. And we participate with God's heart in the world. And we reflect his character. He's generous. All giving is participating with God's heart. And in the Bible, there was really two categories. There's the regular, consistent, planned giving that was the duty of the, of the Jew and of the Christ follower, tithing. But the giving that you regularly do and giving to the work of God in the Old Testament tabernacle, then temple, now church. And then there was charitable giving, giving to the poor, giving to the needy, referenced here in this text, above and beyond. And it was to be done differently than what you regularly gave. That's what Jesus is referring to. When you get, practice your righteousness, giving to the poor, don't do it to be seen by others. So let's look at these questions here. First, a question of motive. A question of motive. Acts of righteousness might be thought of as badge of spirituality, ways of, of measuring up or making yourself right. Jesus says the problem with your religion, if you don't follow this warning, is it's a show. It is a show. The Greek word for seen, he uses there, to be seen by others, is the word theomai. It's where we get our, our, the root for theater or theatrical. It literally means show. In fact, the word he uses for, he calls them hypocrites later. Did you catch that? Later in the text, he says the hypocrites. Uh, hypocrites, which is the word for play actor in Greek. So the actual words he's u- uh, that were, are used here in the scriptures are those words that mean a show. Jesus doesn't say, if you give, he says, when. He assumes it. He assumes we'll give. James picks up this idea in James chapter 2. He says, what good is it if you see your brother in need and you say, I wish you warm and well fed. Go and be blessed, but do nothing about his needs. 
So it wasn't that they weren't giving, it was how and why they were giving. He's saying, when you're, you're giving, is, is on display. Your motive is what? How many of you guys ever um, do something around the house for your, those of you who are married for your wife, and she doesn't notice? She doesn't say anything about it. And she, maybe in the past she's asked you, could you clean the kitchen now and then? Could you help with the, do something? Could you do something? And you think, you know what? I've been hearing about being a good husband at church. I, I'm going to do something. And you do it, and the whole time you're thinking, this is going to make a difference. Maybe later, you know, this is going to pay off some dividends. <laughs> and you do that thing, whatever that thing is, and nothing. And you're waiting, and you're waiting. Maybe you're clanking a dish or something to draw attention to it. <laughs> maybe you're saying, like, hey, I'm over here, you know. I don't know, maybe you're flexing as you wash. I don't know what you're doing, right? You're trying to draw some attention to it, and you get nothing. Is that, any, is that just me? Anybody? <laughs> the audience. What's the audience? I'm doing this so that. I'm doing this so that I, I will benefit from it, so that I'll get the whatever it is. This is why Jesus gives us a warning about hypocrisy. This is the second one. A warning about hypocrisy. The hypocrites he refers to are the scribes and the Pharisees, Israel's religious leaders. Their giving was a show to be seen by men. By definition, then, they're not giving to reflect God's heart or participate in God's purpose in the world, which is why we give. I want to be like my Father in heaven. One of the ways I'm like him is I'm compassionate, generous for those that are in need. That's, how, that's what he's like, and I want to be like him. And I want to participate in what he's doing in the world. Remember last week when we talked about um, not taking revenge and God, the part of the parable Jesus told is that God makes his rain to shine, rain to fall and sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. He's indiscriminate with common graces. Jonathan Edwards wrote a book called The Duty of Charity, a little essay in uh, 17th century uh, New England. And in his book, he talks about the, the objections some of his congregation have to giving to the poor. Now, this is, think about this. This is, this is Puritan New England in the, in the 1700s. And he says, the, the three objections they have is people will say, well, I, I will give if they deserve it. In other words, the, the deserving poor. Those poor that, 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 that they feel are you know, somehow deserving, whatever that category is. I once had a guy uh, offer to give some money to our Benevolent Fund and Shepherd's Heart Ministry, and he said, but he had a list of those he didn't want it to go to. I'm not kidding. A legal pad list, including those who are here illegally, immigrants that were here illegally and others. I, I, want, you to, I want to be sure of that. I'm like, well, that's not something we really police. People come here hungry, we, we feed them. I don't ask them for their green card. And, and he was upset by that. The deserving poor. Uh, then he also, then there's one of the objections is if I, if I feel like I, I have it to give, if I feel, you know, if I do the, like the cost benefit analysis, this is what Jesus is getting at when he says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Does, you, does that sound like a strange phrase to you? Do your hands have minds? Don't, like, don't talk to your right and left hand. I mean, doesn't, isn't, doesn't one brain operate both hands? What's he talking about? Your right hand, I don't know what your left hand is doing. Some speculate this might have been a, pro, a, a Hebrew proverb he's drawing on, but I think his point is this. It should be Moved by the heart, spontaneous generosity to those in need. Not a cost-benefit analysis where you calculate it out and you think it through. Right? Almost like, you're, like you give it without your left hand even knowing what's going on. That's, I think, if you're, if you're left-handed, flip it around. Right? That's his point. You, you, you're, you're moved by a need, compelled by the need. God's spirit speaks to you. You think, I should give to this. And you don't stop to think, well, what will this do to my 401k? Well, do I, what's the balance? Do I have this to give? And should, you, you just respond in generosity. It's not saying be irresponsible, but it's saying be men of generosity that are moved in that moment. And we don't actually stop to do all the math because that's thinking about us rather than thinking about them. I think that's what he's getting at when he says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Some actually scholars think that they really did blow a little silver trumpet when they gave their alms to the poor. Some think it's just an expression. Did you catch that phrase in the text? They blow their trumpets. To be, they, they, they hypocrites do it in the synagogues and on the streets. So they give in the synagogue in the poor box, the box for the poor, and on the streets, and they announce it with trumpets. Some think well, that's just an expression. Others think there was a little trumpet that it sometimes blew. Either way, I think the expression works, doesn't it? We've all got our little trumpets. We've got our, all got our little ways of wanting others to know what we're doing. 
And Jesus says, be careful of that. And then his, his, uh, his antidote or his answer is, what? But when you give to needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, do it secretly so that your giving may be in secret. Now, what does that mean, secret? That no one can ever know? The only giving God approves of is the giving that nobody ever, ever knows about? Is that what he's saying? I don't think so. Because we read stories in the New Testament about people who were generous and they're recorded for us. Somebody knew, right? I mentioned read a story about a man uh, in, a, in a, I was reading, I'm referencing Jonathan Edwards' congregation in New England. I read a biography about him recently. That's why I'm bringing this up. But he had a man in his congregation who was being disciplined by the church. He was under church, church discipline for making more than 4.5% profit on his, on his business. He was put under church discipline because he was making more than 4.5% profit on the sale of his goods. Think about that for just a second. First of all, it's not, there's not much margin. Second of all, the church had a rule about that. And thirdly, they put him under discipline because they found out. How'd they find out? How would, you know, how would, I, how would, I, how would I even know what your margin is? They had a rule about that, and somebody knew. Now, you might be thinking, and rightfully so, that is legalism, and that's a screwed up place, and I don't want to go to a church like that. Neither would I. But there's one part of that that I think is healthy for us to think about. What, what might it be? That little story. A, a man in New England in the six, late 1600s who's under church discipline because he's making too much money in his business. The church has said, we sh you should be giving enough, this is enough to live on, you're giving the rest. Somebody knew. Meaning what? Meaning his finances were not his personal private business and you stay out of it, Christians, pastor, church. I'm not saying we're all going to lay it out here today, but what I'm saying is this. It's good that somebody besides just us, has a, can see, somebody who loves God and loves us, can see where the money goes. That's a good thing. Because we can all rationalize and excuse and find ways to not to deal with that. So when Jesus says, do, give in secret, he's not saying, never tell anyone what you're giving. He's saying, this spontaneous and private side of your generosity is, is the good antidote to the warning in the beginning, right? Be careful, be on your guard, men, that you don't practice your righteousness. Do all your religious stuff to be seen by others. Because if you do that... That's your reward. Let's talk about rewards for a minute. He brings this word reward up three times in the passage. What's he getting at? In verse 1, he says, if you give this way, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. In verse 2, he says, you, they receive their reward in full. Well, which is it? The contrast in the parable here, or in the teaching here, is, is not between giving in public or giving in secret. That's not what he's contrasting. The contrast is, is between rewards from men and rewards from God. That's the whole point here. What are you after? Are you after that you want to look spiritual, look religious, look like a good and generous guy by others, men? If that's what you're after, that's what you get. If you're a play actor on stage, a hypocrite, you get the applause of men. Good job. Good performance. Or are we after the blessing of God to reflect his heart and join his purposes in the world? You can't have both, in other words. In our, in our desire to follow Jesus, we can't have both. You might on occasion get the applause of other men and other women. Good job, fine, whatever. That's, but that's not what I'm after. In fact, more often, more, than, more often than not, if you, we pursue the, the life Christ has called us to, you'll get the opposite of applause of people, won't you? In fact, it's probably not a good sign if all you ever hear is affirmation and applause from the people around you. It means they don't really know you, or you're only surrounded by Christians who think like you. I think sometimes you're going to hear boos, jeers, questions, funny looks. You don't really believe that, do you? What are you doing? I once talked to a guy who said he was very, very generous. He made a lot of money, sold a lot of businesses, and he was extremely generous. And he told me that he said, uh, Pastor Jeff, your job is to tell me I'm not crazy. I said, what do you mean? 
okay, you're not crazy. <laughs> he said, my business partners think I'm crazy. My accountant thinks I'm crazy. My ex-wife thinks I'm crazy for giving all this money away. And every now and then, you got to tell me a story about somebody's heart getting changed so that I know I'm not crazy. Because my whole world is not applauding, good job, good job. They're going, what are you doing? I just need to know that it's worth it now and then. In case that's you, let me just tell you, you're not crazy. Jesus says you can have the applause of men or you can have the blessing of God, but you can't have both. And you could substitute forgiving. He says, he's going to talk about praying in the next section of the text. He's going to talk about fasting. You could put any of the religious duties of our culture in there, the stuff we do. If you're giving in secret, you're seeking something other than human approval, God's heart, God's purpose. And that reward is one that is continually being given by your father. In fact, the phrase, the way the Greeks phrased in the first part, he says, they have received the reward in full. That's literally a phrase that means paid in full, completely paid up, like the receipt's paid. You, that's all you get. It's over. It's phrased differently when it says they'll receive, they will receive the reward from their heavenly father, I meaning it's continually being given and blessed. This is the secret righteousness. So that's the question I want to ask you before I send you to your tables here. Do you want the blessing of God or the applause of men? You want your name on buildings for your donations? You want a dinner in your honor? Invited to the big fancy fundraiser? Or do you want a, a deeper relationship with your father and participate with his heart in the world? I, I, I have a theory that we're going to get uh, to see Jesus someday, those of us that are followers of his, when he returns, and we're going to be with him, and we're going to meet some heroes of the kingdom, and they will not be the best sellers. They will not be the people that are, have the biggest followings on Instagram or, or Facebook. They won't be the ones that everyone, speak at all the conferences, that have written all the books. I mean, there'll be some of those, but I think a lot less. We're going to meet some people that are absolute heroes in the kingdom. We're going to hear their stories and give God praise because they were s secret heroes. Nobody knew about. They did not get the applause, the praise, the accolades, the recognition, the admiration of the world, even of Christians in this life. But they get the blessing of God. Now, this was convicting for me even to think that this through. I want to be that kind of guy. And I think that's what our world needs. C.S. Lewis once said, the problem with the world today it's a book in a, uh, this is in a book called uh, Men Without, an essay called Men Without Chests. It's not a great title for an essay. Hollow Men, Men Without Chests. And he says the problem with the, with the world today, it's full of men who want to be called good without doing what's necessary to actually be good, and then they would be called so in truth. I want you to think I'm good, rather than I want to be good and follow you, and then, and then, and then you'll see me for who I am. But actually, I'm not worried about what you think. I'm worried about what he thinks. It's an issue of audience, isn't it? So I'll uh, give you a little break here. You can get refill your coffee and your uh, donuts or whatever, and then come back and answer these questions. Do you consider yourself a naturally merciful person? And by the way, merciful means generous, charitable, compassionate, all those words. Why or why not? What keeps you from being more that way than you are? What opportunities in your life right now do you have to be both generous and merciful? And I, would, and I would add to that, practicing this discipline of secret mercy. Secret kindness and compassion and mercy. Okay? We'll break, and then we'll come back in a few minutes uh, to wrap up for prayer.